But today, I want to preach a word called the product of purpose. And as we jump into this word, I really want us to reflect on the life of Pastor Mondo and Mona. And I, I want us to, as we look through the life of Paul, really consider how our life can be a life that's lived on purpose and what living a life of purpose is really, really about. I was really praying about what message to share and this message just kept tugging on my heart. And so if you will, open your Bibles with me to the book of, of Acts. And if someone can pass me my notes there, please. I left those on the chair. Those would be very, very helpful. I'm not that good of a preacher. I still need my notes. So Acts chapter 20. Let's turn there together. And we're going to be reading verses 17 through 24. Acts chapter 20 verses 17 through 24. And again, the title of this message is called The Product of Purpose. You know, purpose is an important part of our lives. Our purpose is our reason for living, and it's what encourages us and, in, and what motivates us through, through good times and through bad times alike. One definition of purpose is why you do something or why something exist. Your purpose in life is one of the most imp important things to figure out. There are a lot of people living for a lot of things, but there are some people who have not figured out the one person, the one thing to live for, and that is Christ and his eternal kingdom. There is nothing more important than to live for Christ and his eternal kingdom. The truth is, everyone has some sort of purpose. Everybody chooses to live for something. The question is, what are they living for? The question is, what are you living for? Some people live to be successful, to be prominent. Some people live to be financially stable and wealthy. Some people live to be successful and loved. To be known. And while those purposes are not entirely bad, they can be if they become the sole purpose for which we live our lives. If you are just focused on those things and not Christ and his eternal kingdom, you have fallen short of living out your God-given purpose. Our purpose should not merely be in what we have accomplished or obtained. Our driving purpose should be in our identity in Jesus Christ. To know that you are a son. To know that you are a daughter. To know that you are forgiven. To know that God has placed eternity in your heart. And that you are living for something greater than yourself. That is what it means. I recently read a verse in Jeremiah. I just got done reading through Isaiah and Jeremiah. And in Jeremiah, God says, let, let not the, the wealthy man boast in his wealth and the, the wise man boast in his wisdom and the mighty man to, to boast in his might. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me. And then it goes on to say, in these I delight. The mighty man delights in his might. The wealthy man delights in his wealth. The wise man delights in his wisdom. But God says, this is the one in whom I delight. And in the one who understands and knows me. And the one who understands their purpose. That's the one who I have my eye on. You can be in a room of Harvard, Yale graduates with PhDs with much higher pedigrees than you. But in God's perspective, guess who's the most important person in any given room at any given time? The person who understands and knows God. See, we, 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 we walk in insecurities when we walk into rooms and, oh, they have, they have this job. And it, what's typically the first thing you ask someone that you don't know? Like, what do you do for a living? You know what I mean? It's like, I'm a doctor, you know, at University Hospital and it's, yeah, I'm traveling this weekend, you know, and it's like, it's like, wow, that must be a very important person. 
You know, in the ministry that I'm a part of, I'm part of a ministry called the Church Ambassador Network, and we're in 18 states across the country. And my job is to help connect pastors and faith leaders to government officials. I meet with representatives. I meet with senators. I've met with the lieutenant government. And, and some people's eyes who would be considered some of the most powerful people in the state of Texas. But do you know what I have to remind myself even when I walk into those rooms? They're not more important than me. And neither am I more important than them. We're all on an even playing field in the eyes of God. And what God is interested in is who understands and knows me. And when I walk in there, do you know what I have to understand? That I am a man of purpose. I have come to share the gospel with these people who may not know it. Who may have questions about the decisions that they're facing as an ambassador of Christ. And Pastor Mondo has come with me on some of those meetings to the Austin Capitol. And we walk in there as ambassadors of Christ, understanding our purpose. Our purpose is to share the gospel. Our purpose is to share the truth. Our purpose is to fill places with the spirit and the anointing of God so that we can see God's transformational work take place on this earth. That's what God wants for you. That's what God wants for me. He wants us to be people that walk in our purpose. As we continue to celebrate the life of Pastor Mondo, I want you to reflect back on the things that he has said and the things that he has done. I can assure you Pastor Mondo was a man of purpose. You know, there are other things that Pastor Mondo and Mona could have done than to build this church. They could have started a business. They could have gone into real estate. They could have chose some other career path. But many, many years ago, God spoke to them and said, plant house of prayer church. That is your purpose. That is part of your purpose. And maybe some of you know what that's like when God is leading you to do something when you're living on purpose. You see the evidence, you see the byproduct of the purpose that they lived out through their family, through their, their kids who are worshiping and preaching from this stage. You see the byproduct in his marriage of the purpose that Pastor Mondo lived out. You see the product of his purpose, the purpose that God placed in his heart in this church, that this church is outliving something that he put in Pastor Mondo's heart, even though he's with the Lord in glory. That's living a life of purpose. Living for something greater than yourself. If he would have had a business, maybe that business would have died when he went on to be with the Lord. But he lived, Pastor Mondo lived with an eternal purpose. And so the thing that God allowed him to start is still living on through his family and through his children and through generations to come. Why? Because he understood life is more than me. Life is about you and fulfilling what you want me to fulfill on this earth. The fact that we are gathering in this church to worship Jesus this morning is evidence that Pastor Mondo, that Miss Mona, they are living for more than themselves. And until you know your God-given identity, you can't live out the purposes that God has for your life. If we are going to live a victorious life, we must live out our purpose. I don't know if you uh, have ever watched uh, the movie called The Miracle on Ice. It's the story about the, the Olympic, the 1980 uh, U.S. Olympic hockey team. They faced one of the most powerful, not only countries at the time, but, but uh, um, hockey teams at the time was, were, were the Russians. And in February of uh, 1980, the U.S. Olympic hockey team slipped its foot into a glass slipper and walked away with a gold medal at Lake Placid, New York. Those collagens had shocked the world by upsetting the power Soviet team, and then they grabbed the championship from Finland while the crowd chanted, USA. Before the team's victory over the Soviet Union, which advanced him into the finals, the coach of the U.S. hockey team told his players, you are born to be a player. 
You are born to be a champion ice hockey player. You are meant to be here at this time. This is your moment. This is your purpose. And as that coach reminded his team of their purpose, they went out and they, they, they were victorious in the battle. You see, the, the battles of life that you and I will face are very much contingent on the purpose that we live out. You will not be able to endure the hard times if you are not living on purpose. What does scripture say? Look unto Jesus, the author and the perfecter of your faith, who for the joy that was set before him, what? Endured the cross. What, what does that speak of? The divine purpose that Jesus Christ was living out. How was he able to endure the cross? Some of you feel like you're enduring a hard time right now. Jesus knows what that's like. In the theater of your mind, think of what it feels like to be whipped to be tortured. The Bible says that he was beaten to the point that he was unrecognizable. He was a piece of broken flesh hanging on a cross. And the Bible says that he endured that. How did he endure that? Divine purpose. Suffering may endure for the night. But joy is coming in the morning. I may be on this cross right now, but I'm going to be in glory as soon as I, I breathe my last breath. <laughs> Pastor Mondo has uh, breathed his last breath here on this earth, but I can assure you he is more alive than ever before. He doesn't want to come back down here. He doesn't want to come back down here because he is in a greater glory. Divine purpose. Why was this team of young hockey players able to defeat one of the greatest teams of their era? They were reassured of their purpose. Their, cult, their coach told them, you are born to be a player. You are meant to be here at this time. This is your moment. You see, when we know our divine purpose in life, we have direction. And when we have direction, we will develop the endurance it takes to reach our destiny. With purpose, you can overcome all things, but without it, you will live a life of defeat. Well, that said, let's read Acts chapter 20, verses 17 through 24. Paul speaking, it says, From Maltus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you from the first day I came into the province of Asia. I served the Lord with great humility and with tears in the midst of severe testing by plots of my Jewish opponents. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now... Compelled by the Spirit, I love that, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardship are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. You know, our purpose acts like a guiding compass in our life. When you have a purpose, it guides your attitude, it guides your behavior, and it guides the responses in your life. Many people live life without a divine purpose. They may, they may think that they're living a life of purpose, but they fail to recognize that they're not living a life of divine purpose. And without knowing who they are or where they are going, they are simply living life aimlessly. I remember as a kid watching the uh, Alice in Wonderland movie. Has anybody seen Alice in Wonderland? I know there's been many 
uh, reiterations of that, but I remember, you know, the classic Disney. Back then, Disney was okay to watch. Now I have to censor it and watch the movies before my kids do. But um, in the original Alice in Wonderland movie, there's this scene where Alice is, uh, is walking through the forest. I had a picture of it. Sorry, I, I wasn't able to get those uploaded. But the, uh, she's walking through the forest, and there's all these signs in the forest. And it says, you know, go this way. And then it says, go that way. Turn around. And there's all these different mixed messages. And then as she's walking through that forest with these signs, you're going to go back and watch it on YouTube. All these signs in the forest, there's something in the tree. What was it? The Cheshire cat, right? With crazy eyeballs and I don't know what he was smoking, but something was going on there. And, and he's this kind of this creepy scene, and it's dark. But you know, the life can feel that way. Like, where am I going? I'm getting mixed signals. What should I do in my marriage? What should I do in my career? What should I do in my ministry? I, I, I'm at a place, I'm at a crossroads where I really don't know which way to go. And, and I personally think that Chester Cat's like, that's Satan, right? Just whispering all sorts of confusion and and lies into us. But uh, an unknown author once said that Christians without goals or purpose are like Alice in the fairy tale, Alice in Wonderland. In a conversation between her and the Cheshire cat, Alice asked, would you tell me please which way I ought to go from here? That depends a good deal on where you want to go, said the cat. I don't much care where, said Alice then it doesn't matter which way you go, said the cat. It doesn't matter which way you go because you don't know where you want to go. You see, our life needs direction. Our life needs purpose. Because if if you don't have purpose and direction, you're going to allow anybody and everything, you're going to allow your mind, your emotions, your will to guide you down paths that God doesn't want you to go down. Alice was like, I can go this way or I can go that way. Or there's a sign that says I can turn around. So maybe I should go back to where I started. And the Cheshire Cat's like, well, it doesn't really matter where I'm directing you because you don't really know where you want to go. Confusion. God is not the author of confusion. The Bible says that God's word is a lamp into our feet, a light into our path. God wants to direct you. God wants to give you clarity. God wants to give you purpose. God wants you to know what his plans for your life are. But you have to be curious. It's not just going to come to you. You have to seek him. You have to lean into God every day. You have to ask God, how can I be a part of your plan? That's what it means to live a life of purpose is to wake up every morning and say, God, how can I be a part of your plan? Invite me into your plan today. Show me who I need to speak to. Show me how I need to speak to them. Show me what decisions I need to make. That's what purpose looks like. Without purpose, our lives will drift. We'll be tossed around by people, problems, pressure. If we're, going to over, if we're going to persevere and overcome, we have to have a purpose that is greater than life itself. Several people in the Bible, it will take me all night to list the people in Scripture who lived a life of purpose. But I want to focus on an individual today, and that is the Apostle Paul. That's who we have focused in on here in the book of Acts. You know, Paul was a, life who, he was a man who lived his life for different purposes at different times. If you know the Apostle Paul, before he was Paul, he had this amazing encounter on the road called uh, Damascus. And before he was Paul, he was Saul. He was Saul. He was, he was a persecutor of Christians. Saul was a Jewish historian. He was a lawyer. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish, Jewish Supreme Court of 71 men who ruled over Jewish life and religion. He was the Harvard graduate. That was his purpose. Saul, a leader of the the elect society. But then he has this encounter with God. See, when you have an encounter with God, you can't be the same person you used to be anymore. You can't have the same relationships 
that you had anymore. You can't, you can't have the same habits that you had before. You can't pursue all the same things that you pursued before. Because when God, when you give your life to God, it's up to God to lead you now. And so Paul has this encounter with God and God says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to preach to the Jews and to the Gentiles. I want you to be a vessel for me, a spokesperson for me. I don't want you to persecute my people anymore. I want you to preach the good news. And so Saul becomes Paul. His purpose changed after his encounter with God. And now he lived for one thing and one thing alone. It's to make Christ known. Paul had accomplished wonderful things, but he had also faced many trials. The Bible says he was judged, he was beaten, he was thrown in prison, and he was even stoned and left to die. How many of you are ready to be a Christian? <laughs> I mean, what a bad sales pitch, right? If you want to be a Christian, do you want to be beaten? Do you want to be stoned? Give your life to Christ. That's who Paul was. He said, Lord, I'll follow you. And he had to walk through some challenges. You know, Christianity is not a walk in the park. It's a fight in the forest. But we have the greatest warrior standing by our side. And the Bible says that no weapon formed against us will prosper. It's not like, <laughs> I'm a Christian. Nothing's going to happen to me. A lot of people try Christianity. And then they hit that first challenge. It's like, oh, God must have forgotten about me. No, God never said he would, he would deliver you out of your problems. He said he'd give you the strength to go through it sometimes. Our prayer shouldn't always be, God, deliver me from this, but God, give me the strength to walk through it and give me the wisdom to understand what I need to take from it. Because as you walk through those challenges, guess what? You're going to face similar challenges again. You're going to say, yeah, I've walked through that before. And through the Lord's strength, I've overcome it. So this, this is nothing. It's just like going to the gym. You, you got to develop stamina. You got to develop strength. I tell you, some of the, the most challenging seasons of my life, as I look back, they were the greatest blessings. Because if I hadn't gone through them, God wouldn't have developed my character. He wouldn't have developed my faith. He wouldn't have developed the things that I have now that allow me to face the things that I'm facing. So I say, thank you, God. Thank you that you didn't abandon me. Thank you that you didn't let me go. Thank you that you were with me every step of the way. And now I have the strength to stand before this new pinnacle, this new mountain. And I can climb it with your strength. So Paul went through some difficult things. But despite the trials that Paul encountered, he overcame them. Why? He was a man living with divine purpose. We see this in the writings to the church in Rome when he said in Romans 8:18, 8, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Isn't that the mentality of Christ? I consider that these present sufferings do not compare to the greater glory that will be revealed in us. That's Christ. And that was Paul. And so with that in mind, I want to share with you what purpose produces in the life of a believer. Three things. The plane is, is about to land. I know you're tired. I know you want lunch. It's going to be a, a smooth landing. Okay, I'm a good pilot. We're going to balance this thing out. We're, we're going to land real smooth. And then you'll be on to your next destination. Are you all good with that? Yeah. All right, number one. What does... Divine purpose produced in the life of a believer. Number one, the product of purpose allows you to serve others. Everybody say, serve others. If you are living a life of purpose that doesn't involve serving others, you're living for the wrong thing. Because the greatest purpose that you can live out is a life that serves others. When Jesus walked this earth, he could have made everybody serve him. But what did he do? He became a servant to many. He gathered his disciples and he said, take, take off your sandals. Let me wash your feet. Why? Because the greatest shall be your servant. 
Jesus displayed what it looks like to live a life of divine purpose in an era where the Romans displayed strength and power. And instead of serving others, they wanted to be served. And Jesus' disciples thought, hey, Jesus is here. He's the guy. We're going to overthrow this whole institution. And Jesus said, no, we don't fight that way. We, we don't operate that way. Jesus lived a life of service. And Paul lived a life of service. In Acts chapter 20, verse 19, kind of breaking down the main passage of Scripture in Acts 20, 19, Paul says, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. So Paul, Saul becomes Paul. Now his friends are like, yo, bro, you backstabbed us. You're not part of our crew anymore. They're attacking him. He, he's doing a work that is against their work. And, and Paul says, look, I, I don't operate the same way that y'all operate. Now I live a life to serve others. Part of my purpose, the, the, the first thing that Paul mentions is, look, now I'm a servant now. I'm not a serial killer anymore. I'm a servant. My life's not out to, to harm people, but to do good and to display a life that reflects the life of Christ. Jesus did it. That's what I'm doing. I'm serving others. One of the scariest things in life can be not knowing. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm jumping ahead. When Jesus walked with his disciples, he made it clear the greatest among men is the servant of all. Jesus' service was to share the love and the truth of God to humanity. And although Jesus knew his purpose, walking in it was easier said than done. It is a conscious decision that you have to make every day to serve others. And all the married people said, <laughs> yeah. the spouses aren't even looking at each other right now. They're like, amen. <laughs> I tell you, as a husband, it, it's difficult. I mean, I have to submit myself to God and say, <laughs> I'm going to serve her today, Lord. It doesn't just, I don't just wake up and like, yeah, I'm ready to serve my wife. I'm ready to serve my kids. I'm ready to serve my colleagues. I'm ready to serve that person who gets on my nerves. I mean, I have to say, God, give me the, the humility to serve others well today. I mean, it doesn't just happen. It's not automatic. It has to be intentional. You have to be intentional about living a life that serves others Despite being persecuted, Jesus continued to serve others. Paul did the same. Paul said that he served the Lord during severe testing. Paul said during severe testing from my counterparts, my Jewish brothers, I continued to serve. You're going to have to serve through times of testing. It's not always going to be smooth. You're going to be tested when you serve God. When you try to tell others about Jesus, it's not always going to be received well. I'm going to tell my, 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 uh, my worker about Jesus. Nah, man, I don't want to hear about that. Oh, man, can't believe he didn't accept the message. He's not denying you. He's denying Christ in you. Keep praying for him. Keep praying for her. God didn't say it was going to be easy to serve others. He just said, do it and keep doing it. Over and over again. In moments when others come against you, it will be easy to retaliate out of emotions and hurt. However, you must resist the urge to do so. Pastor Mondo, Mona, I'm sure they, they've encountered some strange people pastoring this church. <laughs> so she looked at me, she's like... <laughs> And they had to make a decision every single day, every single week, every month, every year that they're going to serve whoever walks through those doors. I want to encourage you as Limitless Church, be a church that serves others well. Be a church that serves others well. Because when you love and you serve people and you, you, you share the love and the truth of God's word with them, they'll keep coming back for more. Even more than the activities and the fun and the coffee and all, all that stuff is great. 
But I remember when we were younger, my dad was thinking about starting a church. And I remember we would go to properties and pray. And we, my brothers and sisters would hold hands. And my dad said, you know, maybe, maybe one day I'm going to be a pastor and we're going to pastor a church. My dad says, look, I was David, you were Solomon. You ended up going into full-time ministry, you know. And so I ended up becoming the pastor and pastoring a church. But I remember my dad saying, son, if you ever had the opportunity to pastor a church, he goes, love them and serve them well and make the word of God the primary thing. And I remember I pastored this little, I mean, Mondo, I think Stephen been to the church that I was part of downtown. It was called Cornerstone Central. It was the first satellite campus um, that Cornerstone had in the heart of the city or in a really rough part of the city. Um, but I remember just saying, God, I, I don't really have all the resources. I don't, I don't have a team around me yet. Like we started off in the midst of a transition, the pastor was exiting and I was just like walking into like this chaos. And I remember just praying and like, God, what do I do? And I remember God just like kind of reverberating those words that my dad spoke into my heart many years ago. Serve well, love well, preach the gospel. And other stuff started to come. Resources started to come. Volunteers started to come. But the main thing was the main thing. We are going to live a life of purpose. We are going to serve well. We are going to love well. We're going to preach the gospel. And I promise you if, you, if you focus on those things, God will grow his church. And God, God will allow you to reach so many people in your life. By living in God's purpose, you can continue to forgive others, to reach out to others, and to serve others in a Christ-like way. Another thing that living on purpose produces is it, it will allow you to face the unknown. Everybody say, face the unknown. How many of you like facing the unknown? I mean, how many of you like walking into your jobs and your boss says, yeah, you know, we're just going through some financial challenges and, um, yeah, we're going to have to lay you off. Yes, I was looking forward to that. What an awesome day. Honey, I just got laid off from my job. Praise God. None of us like, like just walking into the unknown. I certainly don't. I mean, my wife's probably more spontaneous than me. She'll, she'll change the day like five times a day. And I'm like, whoa, just throw me off. Any like, like type A personalities, organized people, like you don't like when your schedule changes. Like I, I'm, I'm, I'll probably, I probably eat at the same five restaurants around my neighborhood, okay? My wife's like, why are we eating there? I want to try something new. <laughs> She's like, you need to put more time and effort into finding things that are new. I'm like, I don't have time for that. You know, if, if we're in like another state or country, I'm like, yo, let's go to BJ's, Pazuki night. My wife's like, we got BJ's in San Antonio, you know. Another Jalisco's, really? <laughs> I don't know how many Jalisco's there are. There must be on like 10,500. I mean, the numbers just keep growing. I'm like, how many cousins do y'all have in your family? Good God. But anyway, uh, look at Acts chapter 20, verse 22. Paul goes on to say, he says, and now compelled by the spirit. I love that. Compelled by the spirit. I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. <laughs> so Paul's living a life of purpose. And he says, I'm going to Jerusalem. And his, his amigos say, what are you doing? And I don't know. All I know is I'm going to be persecuted. <laughs> Woohoo like, well, that may not be a good idea, bro. Living a, God told me I'm going to Jerusalem. That's my next stop. It's on the itinerary right here, San Antonio, Dallas. And yep, Jerusalem, that's next. But, but you just said you're going to be persecuted. Yeah. That's where God told me I'm going. Why? That was God's purpose for his life. You know, sometimes God calls us into the unknown. He calls us into uncharted territory. And, and sometimes I think God doesn't give us all the answers because if he did, we would have no need for faith. If, you, if God gave you all the answers, you wouldn't need him. God, where am I going to work? Who am I going to marry? How many kids am I going to have? What is my life going to look like in one year, three year, and five year? Thank you, God. 
If God were to say, okay, this is who you're going to marry. This is what job you're going to have. This is how many kids you're going to have. This is what your life's going to look like in the next one, three, five years. You'd be like, gotcha. I don't need you anymore. Bill Johnson says that, that, that God allows there to be a mystery in our future so that we can depend on him today. God allows there to be a mystery in our future so that we can depend on him today. Some of you are like, I don't know where I'm going. Good. God's not going to show you the whole picture sometimes. What did he tell Abram? He said, leave, leave, leave your town. Leave San Anto. Where to? I'll show you when you get there. Go read it. He says, I'll show you when we get there. You're going to want to write this down. God revealed this to me several years back, and it has radically transformed my life. God will often give you direction before he gives you details. What did he tell Abraham? Go, direction. Go that way. Where? I'll give you the details as you take another step. God gives us direction before he gives us details, because if he gave us details, we wouldn't need him anymore. So sometimes it's like, God, can you show me 10 steps? He's like, I'll show you the first step. Go ahead and take the first step, and then I'll show you the second step. And with each step, your faith grows. With each step, you see the, cl- the picture more clearly. And guess what? You get to step 10, and you go, dang, God, you're awesome. woo Like, when I started pastoring that church downtown, I was like, God, can you show? I mean, I walked into it, and it was a mess. I was like, what are we going to do with it? I was like, God, can you show me what? God said, no, just uh, preach the gospel next Sunday. And then after several years of pastoring that church, I look back, and I said, God, you are the God of miracles. You brought in every person. You provided every resource. You did far more than I can ever ask, think, or imagine Your ways are higher than my ways, God. You're so amazing. You'll never understand the plans of God looking forward. But when you look back, you will see clearly how faithful God is in your life. Some of you are looking back right now at those moments where you're like, God, can you just show me? Nothing good can come from this. And now you're looking back at the last year of your life, three years of your life, five years, ten years, and you're saying, God, you are awesome. He's so good. He's so good. His, it, it amazes me how good God is, how perfect his plan is, how perfect his purpose is over our lives. The Bible says that his plans and purposes, that, 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 that they were preordained before the foundations of the world existed. He, he had already had a purpose over your life. He had your days numbered. He, he's, he has it figured out, so stop trying to figure it all out. Don't shout me down. I said, he has it all figured out, so stop trying to figure it out. Just trust him. Just take him by the hand every day and say, hey, what does today hold? Lead me in it. Guide me in it. Paul said, God, I don't know what what faces me in Jerusalem, but I know you're you're here with me now and you're going to be there with me in Jerusalem. I don't even know where I left off. You know, that happens sometimes. Um, We'll just go on to to point number three. I think I've preached on that enough. Are you all okay with that? Okay. And I'm going to ask the the worship team to come up or keyboard or I don't know, however you all do that. But the last thing living a life of purpose produces is it'll cause you to live for eternity. To live for eternity eternity. The Bible says that God has placed eternity in our hearts. You know, I'm, I'm convinced that even the atheist and the agnostic thinks about eternity. They may not believe in it, but I think they're fascinated by it. I think each and every one of us, you know, last night my kids were outside and apparently there was like this meteor shower. Anybody hear about the meteor shower? And my kids were like, I want to see the meteor shower. And, and they, were, they were just so fascinated by the meteor shower and this, the concept of space. And, and I think most people, when they look at space, they just can't help but think, how far does space go? 
uh, I, I don't think it ends. And neither does eternity. We are, we are part of this window of history called time. And if time was a line, right? This is when you were born. There's a little dot right here. I'm going to draw it. You see it? There's a dot. There's a line. There's another dot. This time of your death. Now draw a circle around all of that. Everything within that circle is time. Everything outside of that circle is eternity. Time is so short to be living for things that don't matter. And I'm so inspired by men and women of God like Pastor Mondo and Mona and by their entire family and even you as a church. I'm so inspired by people who live their life for eternity because that's what we're supposed to be living life for. And in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, Paul says, however, I consider that my, my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and to complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Paul was speaking about his eternal purpose. My life is nothing. This little window of time in history that I'm living in is nothing compared to the greater plan that God has for me and for humanity. We are marching towards an eternal kingdom that will never end, that will have a king who will reign forever. We won't have elections anymore. We won't have to vote for someone anymore. It'll be him and it'll be his people and we will worship and serve him forever. And that's what we're living our lives for. Don't get stuck in the mundane. Don't get stuck in the ordinary. Don't get stuck in the things that have no eternal value. Don't let the little things conquer you anymore. God has a greater plan and purpose for your life. I want to encourage you to allow God to elevate your, your vision, your perspective. It's so easy. I'm with you. It's so easy just to get to, to be down here in the woods. God says, I want to take you to the mountaintop. I want to give you an aerial view so that you can, you can see things my way. Today, there are more distractions than ever. There are distractions on our phones, distractions on the billboards as we're driving to our house or to a restaurant, distractions on television. So much is screaming at our attention, our time, our resources. And with all the distractions coming our way, it can be difficult to focus on what truly matters. Our relationship with God our relationship with our family, our relationship on reaching the unlost, uh, the, the lost and the unsaved. When we aren't in a relationship with God, our hearts can be callous and our vision can be blurred, making it hard for us to focus on those things. At one point, Paul had a callous heart he had a distorted view on what was important in life. Paul had a purpose, but his purpose was not in line with God's. But after he encountered God, oh, how things changed. After he encountered God, oh, how things changed. Some of you can testify to that this morning. After I encountered God, how things changed. How my life turned around how my purpose was renewed. His heart became open to God. His focus and aim was to do one thing, to finish the race, to complete the task that the Lord Jesus had given him. And, and I share this word with all of you, but I, I specifically want to share it with Pastor Mondo. And th this is to your siblings as well, because I, I know that y'all all, all co-lead this church together with your your beautiful mother, but 
it, it's clear that the mantle has fallen very much on you, Mondo, to be the pastor of this church. You have a divine purpose and anointing on your life. It was the same divine purpose and anointing that was on your father's life. Look at me. It's the same divine purpose that was on your father and on your mother's life. God is with you. God is with you. God is with you, Andrade family. God is with you, Limitless Church. That purpose is not done. Your dad, your husband, he knew that. He knew that this thing that God has birthed through me, it's going to live on to eternity. It's going to live on to eternity. And right now he's part of the great cloud of witnesses saying, come on, son. Come on, daughter. Come on, sweetie. Keep running your race. Keep preaching the gospel. Keep making the main thing the main thing. Don't let the little things distract you. Don't let the job distract you. Don't, don't let the conflicts distract you. Don't, don't let the devil have a foothold in your life and in your marriage. He's saying, let the main thing be the main thing. I want to encourage you, Andrade family and Limitless Church, look at the life of Pastor Mondo. He was a pastor that lived his life on purpose. And guess what? Your life in this church is a product of God's purpose in his life. This is the product of purpose. You are the product of purpose. You're the product of a man of God who believed in you, who loved you. Before some of you even came to this church, God had put it in Pastor Mondo's heart to start this church for you. And even though he's not here anymore, God knew the time that he would take him home. And he knew the time that he would bring you into this home. You're where you're supposed to be. Pastor Mondo is where he's supposed to be. And if you're questioning where you're at and where you're supposed to be, God wants to give you peace this morning. God wants to give you purpose this morning. God wants to give you direction this morning. And like I said, he may not show you the whole picture, but he's going to give you the first steps. And for some of you, that first step may be, I need to get plugged into a local church. For some of you, that first step may be, I need to start volunteering at Limitless Church. I need to invite a friend or a family member to Limitless Church. I need to share the gospel with my coworker. It's going to look different for all of you, but I can assure you, if you rely on God, he'll be there with you every step of the way.